Thomas, who is a professor of economic dynamics at the University of Amsterdam, um, and also one of our grantees for a very interesting project, a grant called Heterogeneous Expectations and Financial Crises, um, which he abbreviates as Hex Fix. So I think he's coming up with a fix for the hex that is, that is, that is hurting us, I think maybe is the joke. Um, welcome, Cars. Am I right about that joke? Yes, you could, yes, that's a nice description of the project. Yes. Okay, um, so the word uh, expectation seems to be key here. Um, that what you have in mind is that people are forming expectations of the future, forecasting uh, heuristics in different ways. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think uh, expectations are of course very important uh, in economics. Uh, it's may maybe the distinguishing feature uh, between economics and the natural sciences. Expectations are part of the law of motion of the economy. Uh, and as you know, the, the, the standard solution to the expectations uh, uh, problem is the rational expectations hypothesis. We have an alternative, a behavioral alternative with heterogeneous expectations. And the main idea is that people just uh, use simple heuristic. Now, what do you mean by heuristic? What's a heuristic? Give me an example. Uh, a heuristic is just a simple forecasting rule. So, for example, the simplest may be naive expectations. You just, uh, your forecast is just the last observation that you have seen. So tomorrow is just like today. Exactly. That's what you mean. That's exactly. a simple heuristic. And very important, it also could be a simple trend following rule. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you forecast the last observation plus uh, the last uh, price ch change or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and our theory uh, has then switching between these uh, uh, simple forecasting heuristic based on their relative performance. Uh, so there's a tendency of individuals to switch to rules that have performed uh, better in the, in, in the recent past. Oh, I see. So this is a computer model, ultimately, of people of a population of people, some of whom have one rule, some of whom have another, they make different choices. They make different choices. Th there's heterogeneity. Yes, yes. That's the point. Yes. And then they interact and something happens and then they choose again. Yes. That's the way it works. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I'm familiar with this sort of thing. I, get, I think I get this. But what's interesting about your project is that it seems to be uh, calibrated in some way or that you're, you're, you're taking the rules or the, these heuristics um, from actual experiments on actual people. Um, and also, I think, maybe from some, some empirical surveys or something? Yes, yes. From tell, me, tell me how you do that. Well, uh, so let me first uh, talk about the experiments. Eh? The experiments. Uh, laboratory experiments are very important in uh, economics. And you can use the laboratory to study expectations and to study forecasting behavior. And that's what we have been doing in Amsterdam already for quite some time, for about 10 years. Uh, and uh, so you bring students there, they sit behind a computer, they do forecasting. We give them uh, only some qualitative information about the market environment. And given this limited information, we study what happens to the market, both on individual forecasting and on aggregate behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so what we found is that uh, the model with simple heuristics describes the forecasting behavior in the, in the laboratory uh, very well. Uh, and another, uh, I think, very important finding yeah. is the type of feedback is really important for the aggregate outcome of the market. L let me give two examples. Yes. The classical example is the, the cobweb model, the hog cycle model, that John Muth was using in his classical paper on rational expectations in 1961. That's an example with negative feedback. When expectations go up, producers produce more, and therefore the realized Prices price fall. goes down. Now, in that environment, we have found in the laboratory that is quite a stable environment. Uh, prices converge, prices converge to equilibrium. So mm -hmm. if you run an experiment with negative feedback... So Muth was sort of right. Muth was sort of right. OK. Uh, in his in, environment. In negative feedback environment. Nice. Because the other crucial finding that we have, that typically when you have positive feedback, Muth was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and positive feedback is very important in finance, in macro, because in a, in a stock market, uh, when, when investors are optimistic, they, they buy more stock, so the price goes up. Mm -hmm. And what we find in these experiments that in positive feedback systems, um, prices do not converge, but prices oscillate. And then what is interesting, we can fit our heuristic switching model to both environments, and the same model explains both different types of behavior. Mm -hmm. Namely, what happens is that in a positive feedback environment, the trend-following heuristics do quite well. 
So when there is a trend just by accident, the individuals perceive this trend and they start extrapolating this trend and this reinforces the trend. And, then and so they make money. They make money. Yeah, the ones who follow the trend make money. And a bubble forms. Um, so now, when you say these things match, what you're matching is the behavior in the laboratory with the behavior of the computer model. Yes. But what about the real world? Well, we've also fitted these models on real data, oh. uh, estimated these models on real data, for example, on stock market data. Uh, we've estimated the model on the S&P 500 data, for example. And also there, the switching, the heuristic switching model uh, matches quite well. And in particular, for example, if you look at the dot-com bubble, what happens is that due to a po few positive shocks, new technology, the internet technology, uh, that pushes the prices up a little bit for fundamental economic fundamental reasons. And then this, these trend-following rules are reinforcing this trend, and that is a, an explanation of the amplification mm -hmm. of the stock market uh, bubble, the dot-com bubble, by trend-following behavior. Now, I'm interested in how you got into this complexity economics sort of approach. I see that your uh, undergraduate degree was in mathematics. So how did you get from math into math econ? Um, how did that happen? Well, actually, I was teaching. I yes. was teaching to economic students. I was teaching mathematics to economic students. Just calculus and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. And linear exactly. algebra. Exactly. So uh -huh. then I became interested in economics. And so I had the opportunity to do a PhD at the economics department. and. Be, coming from mathematics, uh, I had a background in nonlinear dynamical systems. Uh, actually, one of my thesis advisors in Groningen was a famous mathematician, Floris Takens. Uh, he is the inventor of the notion of strange attractors. And then when I moved into economics, it was really strange to me that, you know, why is economics only focusing on stable steady state, stable behavior? Why would markets only because be Because we can solve stable? them. Be because you can solve them, it's true, it's true. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, from a scientific point of yes. view, stable steady state is one of the generic possibilities. But from nonlinear dynamics, we know that also periodic motion and chaotic motion on strange attractors are just other generic possibilities. So that was very strange to me, at coming into economics, uh, this mm -hmm. belief in stability, uh, you could say. Mm -hmm. So you were doing some new economic thinking, it sounds. And did you have a hard time, you know, getting going? Yeah, I, I must say I had as yeah. a PhD student. For example, I thought one of the models in my thesis that I worked on was Hicks' nonlinear trade cycle model. And I found chaotic behavior in that trade cycle model, but it's not a model with micro foundations. So when I try to publish this work in economic journals, you get the usual reaction that the model is not micro founded. And actually very interesting, when I was reading Hicks' book, he has somewhere a graph of that possibility. He was, he was calculating the solution point period by point, by period. period by period. Uh -huh. And he has a time series that starts oscillating uh -huh. like it looks all uh, unstable. And, yeah, and this book is from like before World War II, I think, isn't it? No, it's 1950 or 1951. 51, uh, yeah. uh, and, but it's before Edward Lorenz uh, discovered chaotic motion in meteorology. So, I mean, my feeling was always that if Hicks would have had a, a computer on his desk, he might have found chaotic behavior in his model. And mm -hmm. How would that affect if have, have uh, affected uh, economic thinking? Uh, we might not have gone down this path. That, I don't that, know. That we did. Interesting, interesting idea. Well, so now we're hoping in supporting this grant, we can help you support a next generation of new economic thinkers. Yeah. Um, and um, we're very pleased to have you and welcome you to our stable of INET economists and look forward to seeing your, your results. Thank you very much. Thank I you. Agree.